Assalamu alaikum Dr. Adil, thank you for joining us uh, in this session and for agreeing to do this session with us. Many people are asking us if we move to Canada, how do we practice there as a dentist, what options are there, do they have to repeat the BDS or do they have to give the license exam, or if they have to get married locally, do they have to do something through the citizenship? I don't know, uh, I haven't done any of these things, so maybe you have more experience in this. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Adil is one of my best friends, and when I say one of my two, three are my best friends. One of my best friends, so Dr. Adil is one of my best friends, and one of my best friends, so Dr. Adil is one of my best friends, so Dr. Adil is one of my best friends. Uh, he's also my batchmate uh, from uh, Pakistan, Karachi, where we had a bachelor's. Kiya tha. And then he moved to States for, uh, you know, to get uh, more money to earn more money. So he thought he'd go to Canada. No, I'm just kidding. He, he had planned that his whole family and everyone would settle in Canada. So very early on, he started to prepare for it. And he did it. And now he's currently practicing in Canada. So it's good that we will know how to practice it. I'm just going to give you a channel. ताकि ये मेरे थ्रू आपको बता सके जितने लोग देख रहे हैं इस वीडियो को देख रहे हैं कि भाई वहां अगर जाना है तो कैसे प्रैक्टिस करते हैं और क्या क्या ऑप्शन है आपको वहां पे एक लाइफ स्टार्ट करने के लिए सो so, होगा ये कि डॉक्टर आदिल नाउ विल टेक ओवर एंड ही विल यू नो शो हिज एंटायर प्रेजेंटेशन जो इन्होंने बनाई है इसके लिए और जब वो पूरा बता देंगे तो मैंने इंस्टाग्राम पे जो लोगों को लिखा था स्टोरी लगाई थी कि किसी को कोई भी सवाल है क्योंकि मैं वीडियो बना रहा हूँ कैनेडा पे तो वो मुझे बता दे ताकि मैं डॉक्टर आदिल से पूछ लूँ तो जब तक इनकी बिजनेस खत्म नहीं होती आप सवाल पूछ लें वहाँ पे एंड जब इनकी बिजनेस खत्म हो गई तो हम इनसे वन ऑन वन सवाल वो पूछ लेंगे जो आपने मुझसे इंस्टाग्राम पे पूछे हैं ठीक है हर सवाल के दस डॉलर होंगे जाकरों को पैसे वैसे नहीं है डॉक्टर आदिल को भी पैसे नहीं मिल रहे इस चीज के तो इसीलिए वो बेचारे मुझे हर दो हफ्ते बाद बोलते थे कि चलो एक दिन करेंगे ये तो नहीं मजाक कर रहा हूँ डॉक्टर आदल इज अ वेरी हेल्पफुल पर्सन एंड वो अपने आपको प्राइवेट ईमेल नंबर भी दे अपना आपको सेल्फोन नंबर भी दे देंगे हेल्प करने के लिए आई एम जस्ट मैसिंग मजाक कर रहा हूँ डॉक्टर आदिल थैंक यू अगेन फॉर ज्वाइनिंग प्लीज सेशन स्टार्ट करें आप थैंक यू फॉर हैविंग मी विल जस्ट स्टार्ट नाउ मोस्ट वेलकम सो हाई एवरीबडी माई नेम डॉक्टर आदल बेसानिया आई एक्चुअली I'm uh, originally I was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and then I moved here to Canada in 2013. I'll just go through a quick summary of my uh, dental story, and then we'll continue from there to learn about how you can learn, uh, how to sort of practice dentistry in Canada. So here's a quick overview of how my dental journey has gone so far. I did my bachelor's of dental surgery from Karachi University through Fatma Jinnah Dental College in 2011. Completed my house job from the same school in 2012. Moved to Canada in November of 2013. 2014 was spent giving the NDEB exams, going through university admission processes, stuff like that. 2017, 2015, I got accepted into University of Toronto. Finished that program in 2017. Then, and since 2017, I'm sorry. And since 2017, I have been working in Ontario, Canada. This is sort of the journey that you would be going, uh, taking the flight from Pakistan right here. Uh, that's me on the day I was leaving for Canada. That's Fazan right there, and that's Usman. They're two of my closest friends from dental school from Fatma Jinnah. We were all in the same batch. So <laughs> that's us leaving. This was actually on 7th of November, 2013, at about... I would say roughly about 6.30 in the morning or so when I was flying off. 14 hours later, you're landing in Canada. So that's an exciting moment. And somewhere around this time, whether before or after, uh, you'll have different sort of questions. You'll be confused whether before, it's before leaving Pakistan, if you've already decided, you're thinking about stuff like where to start, who to ask, what to study. You may have some idea about USA, UK, Australia, different parts of the world, uh, but you not, don't have much idea about how to deal with it in Canada. So we'll go over all that today. A few options regarding uh, dentistry here in Canada that you have. Uh, they're like dental assistant, you can become a hygienist, you can become a general dental practitioner, a specialist dental practitioner, you can do something in public health, you can go for research options, and there's more options, stuff like teaching and other stuff. Okay. So this is the outline of how we're going to be talking. We'll be more, sorry, on this slide, we'll mainly be focusing today on, because the series is like practicing in a foreign country. So we'll be dealing with sort of these two right here, practicing as a general practitioner or practicing as a specialist. Anything else, if you have any other questions, I have my contact info at the end. 
just reach out to me and we can discuss it separately then because otherwise this presentation would, it would go on for hours, right? So here's the outline, uh, general overview, just a quick summary of how everything is before we dive into depth, where and how to start. You got your documents verified, what to do now. You cleared your first exam, what's next? Should you decide on going to school or should you continue with direct licensing? What are the costs associated with it? The next two points, uh, these ones right here, these are interchangeable. You'll only be doing one of them. You won't be doing both of them, but we'll be taking a look at both. So these two, the ACJ and ACS, that is if you go with the direct licensing right here, or if you go to school over here and completed your DDS, what to do now. So once you're done with either of those two points, we'll be looking at, I'm almost done. You're ready to apply for your license. And finally, you'll be reaching at the end. You'll basically be successful right here when you say, I did that. So the general overview, let's just get started over there first. Um, yeah, basically everything that I have in this presentation, all my material, everything has come from one place only. And so there's some of them that is my input in there, yes, but most of my stuff, any pictures you see, any slides you see, screenshots, stuff like that, they're all from this website. All the information is available on this website. It is not the National Dental Examining Board of Canada, NDEB. Here's the link for it. Uh, please don't mix it up with NDBE, which is the National Dental Board of Exam something. That's the American one. The, Can the Canadian one is NDEB. The position of the E and B is interchanged between the both, between the two. So once you go onto this website, um, right here, the first thing you see is that this is just a temporary thing right now, the exams cancellation due to COVID that will go away soon. Usually what you'll be seeing is you'll be seeing these three items right there, graduates of accredited dental program, graduates of non-accredited dental programs, and then graduates of specialty dental programs. Um, graduates of, let's just look at all three. The one that applies to a general dental practitioner from Pakistan is this middle one right here, the graduates of non-accredited dental programs but we'll take a look at all three quickly. Graduates of accredited dental programs, if you click on that, you'll automatically see it doesn't apply to anybody from Pakistan, India, stuff like that, right? Those are schools which are accredited dental programs that they have certified that their curriculum is according to their guidelines. So those are just schools in Canada, US schools, Australian, the New Zealand Council, Irish Council, and then one university in Saudi Arabia. So no other school, no other university in the world would fall under this criteria. It's just these few that do. So now we'll be going back to graduates of non-accredited dental programs, which would be the one for most of us. Here's a flowchart that sort of explains. Forget about everything on the left side of the screen. Uh, it's just explained in words. I'll just go through the right side of the screen myself with you right now. So application to the NDEB equivalency process and credential verification. Uh, we'll go over each step in detail as well now, uh, but uh, just go over it quickly over here. So basically, first of all, you send your documents. You just fill out an application form to the national board saying, this is my name, date of birth, which country you're applying from, stuff like that. Um, you send, they ask for some documents of you. They ask for like a one government issued photo ID, um, I don't think they ask, no, they don't ask for IELTS results. They ask for like government issued photo ID, your degree, your marks transcripts, uh, stuff like that. We'll go through all that as well. Once your application is approved, it takes about six to eight weeks for them to do that. You give basically the first exam. So anybody coming to Canada from any non-accredited non -accredited dental program, which is anywhere except those few schools that we discussed first, they have to give this exam, which is assessment of fundamental knowledge. We will be looking at each exam in detail as well. Um, once you pass that exam, you have two options. One is you give two more exams right here, which is the assessment of clinical judgment, also known as ACJ, or then the assessment of clinical skills, also known as ACS. And then the other program, the other option you can take is like you go to school, which is basically a degree completion program. Uh, I'm just checking for some messages right there. Okay, I have none. That's good. Um, sorry. So you what? Let's say you you prefer not. Go, you don't want to go to school. You want to give the two exams directly. You meet that standard. You pass those two exams. You just transfer to the certification process. This is just basically an application. Nothing complicated right here. 
And then you come to this step where you have to give a written and an ASCII exam. If you went to the degree completion route, you don't do this part over here. You go to school for two years, two and a half years. Some schools are now changing their program to three years now, so it could be three years as well. So anywhere from two to three years, you do that part of your program. Uh, and then basically, again, you just send in an application to the NDEB saying, I want to get certified now. You go to the written, you give the written and the OSCE exam. Once you clear that, so anybody that does either route, whether they go to school, whether they do the judgment exam and the skills exam, everybody has to give this NDEB written examination and OSCE. Nobody's exempt for that. Even the local students that have done their junior school, middle school, high school year, gone to university over here all the way from first year, even they have to give this exam. So nobody's exempt from giving this certification exam, okay? Once you meet that, you're NDEB certified. Once you're NDEB certified, then you can apply for your license in whichever province you want to apply for. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to type it uh, as we go along. I'll try to keep an eye on it as well. Um, if I miss anything, we'll go through all the questions at the end. Maybe Fazan can like put it in the chat or something and we can go at the end. So that was a, the general overview. Now we go to where and how to start. Again, like we discussed, the first thing, very first thing you do is you apply with your documents and stuff. So let's just take an in-depth look at that. How to do it, you go to the website. There's an arrow right here. You see that red arrow right here that says how to apply. You go to that. This pop-up opens up. Again, right now, the equivalency process has been suspended due to COVID-19. That's a temporary thing there. It should open up right now. You'll see all these, these three things right here. You'll obviously make your application first. Self-assessment is just a practice test that you might have over there. It's like a 100-question practice test. If you want to study a little bit first, and then you just want to judge where you stand, you can do that. And then qualifying and degree completion programs is if you want to go to school. Here's the required documents that you would need to submit with your application right here. So application to the NDEB equivalency process. Uh, so you yes, basically it says step one, create an online profile, just asks for your personal details. Step two, submission of required documents, which you have to submit. I'll just show those to you on the next slide. And then step three, credential verification, which the NDEB does for you. So you have to submit a few things which are by you. Uh, there's a form that you have to print out, sign and date, your ID, usually a passport or something like that, uh, a notarized photocopy of that, difference in name, if there's a name change, you do that for sure, your diploma or degree. One of the things that's not required is like an internship certificate. So you don't need to have a house job completion certificate or something before you apply to the NDEB. They don't require that, right? So once you're done with your final year, once you have your degree, which is this thing right here, the diploma or the degree, uh, you're good to apply. You don't have to do necessarily a house job to apply for to the NDEB for these exams. These two steps right here, confirmation of graduation and academic record, it says directly by the issuing university. So whichever your university is, where you've uh, completed your degree from, you need your university to send these two documents to the NDEB directly. It, it has to go from a university where it says to and from. So the to address would be like the NDEB address. The from address has to be that university address. It's a sealed envelope. They do that wax seal stuff on it. And then they send it off to the NDEB so that it's tamper proof of nothing. Nothing's being tampered with. Nothing's been edited. So the NDEB is really particular about these, guys, these things, guys. So just make sure that it's directly issued by your university. Um, okay, I'll just go through like the questions a little bit quickly. Um, how to get into MSc clinical subject in Canada after clearing license exam. We'll go through that at the end when I talk a bit about specialty. Before university admission, we have to give part one NDEB written exam. So um, yes, that is correct. So there's no part one actually, it's called the AFK, Assessment of Fundamental Knowledge. Yes, you're, based on the score that you get in the exam, you apply to universities, right? IELTS is requirement for exam and how much, but I'll go through that again. IELTS, I'll be bringing it up a little bit later when we talk about. So for the exam, you don't need to put your IELTS in for the AFK exam, but when you're applying to universities, yes, they do need like your IELTS or TOEFL or they have one more exam there as well. I forget the name right now, but there's three that they, I think it's a, something Canadian benchmark English exam, something like that. But there's three exams that they accept. They have different scores for each. 
uh, these are all, so everything that I've, uh, all the screenshots, all the pictures that I've put in, I've put in links there as well. So you guys can just directly go onto the website and see that they have videos on the website as well, how to fill stuff out. So that's really helpful. It's not a complicated website at all. It's pretty self-explanatory if you go over there and click on like the different, uh, pretty like intuitive there. Um, just spend some time, understand what the system is and it should be fine. So that's like the basic application process. Uh, this application fee, it's payable once for $900. That's just for document verification. This is not the fees for any exam. You just pay this to have your documents verified by them, okay? Now we go to the next stage, which says, I got my documents verified, what now? So now you basically on the step two, which is AFK assessment of fundamental knowledge. Um, the registration fee for that exam is $800 right here. Study and give the ESK exam. We'll go over what to study and stuff like that too. Two books of 150 multiple choice questions, three are per book and 75 or greater is considered pass. So on the NDB website, you will see this little thing there as well. Uh, if you go to protocols for every exam has a, like a separate PDF document for it saying protocols for the AFK exam, protocols for the skills exam, protocols for judgment exam, protocols for written exam, protocols for OSCE exam. There's protocols for all the exams over there, right? So if you go into the protocols for the AFK exam, you'll see something like this. Uh, it might change every year. This is from the 2019 protocols, I think. I'm not 100% sure it might be 19 or 20, but whenever you're giving it, you'll be getting this. It just gives you an approximate percentages of questions from each section. So as you see, pharma, emergency medicine, local anesthesia has a pretty heavy weightage. Endo is a separate subject on its own. Some subjects have been merged together. For example, over here, you see ortho, pedo, geriatric dentistry, special needs patients, embryology, growth and development. Collectively, you'll see about 10%. So out of 300, roughly, you'll see about 30 questions on this. About one quarter of the questions on like pharma, local anesthesia, just to give you an idea of where to concentrate more, right? Uh, and then you have oral surgery, trauma, dental emergencies, including anatomy, about an approx 10%. So Keep this in mind when you're studying as well. You obviously want to spend more time on subjects that have a higher weightage over there. Uh, don't disregard anything. Study study everything, of course. It's important. This is just an approximate percentage. They don't follow this exactly by the number. They're not supposed to follow this exactly by the number. This is just to give you an idea. Um, yeah, and so we just come to what to study for AFK. Let me just go to right here where I can see your pictures as well. Okay, perfect. So AFK, so it depends where you are, I would say. If you are in Pakistan right now, um, I would say probably start with the various materials available. Dental Dex is one of them. Usually people prefer more, if you saw that sheet earlier, it's more clinical based. So I would say do part two more for all the books. There's Dental Dex, there's Mosby Review, there's um, your first aid books. So do those ones. Uh, and then there's something called Pharmacology Tufts as well, which is like a pretty small book, but it just condenses all the pharma information basically in there. So that's a good little book to read as well, especially for pharma. And the other thing that is there is on the NDB website, they have, uh, a, I have the link in my presentation as well, but they have a resource where there's released questions. It's about 400 pages worth of released questions, right? You can start going through that as well, see how the questions differ from what you've been used to doing over there. There's a concept of rote learning, uh, which we call like ratta, right? So that doesn't work over here, guys. The questions over here, they're quite conceptual. You need to understand everything. So I have the link in my presentation as well towards the end, I'll point it out to you guys and try to understand everything that you're reading and but then basically uh, do some of the practice questions there as well, see how you're, preparation is coping up with it. If you need to go something, study something more, that's an option too. When you come to Canada, again, basically the same things still apply. You still have to study dental decks, first aid, Mosby, whatever. But there are a lot of preparatory test centers as well. I think somebody has asked that question as well. Is it necessary to take prep course for AFK? Uh, it's not 100% necessary, but I personally would highly recommend it, right? The reason, because this is a very, first of all, it's a very stressful exam. 
there's a lot to study so the preparatory course can guide you what to study what not to study stuff like that uh, they have a systematic part that they follow take you subject wise they teach you the subject they make you do the released questions for that subject stuff like that uh, the other important thing i would say is you have only three attempts at every exam so let's say the exams happen twice a year all exams so afk for example happens in february and then again in august so but you only have three attempts so i would highly recommend don't waste any attempt trying to just see that oh i can maybe wing it myself take a preparatory course because every attempt is valuable if you lose all three attempts for example if you're not if you not able to pass through any of those three attempts basically this option closes for you this career path closes for you forever that's not something that you want to risk right so plus it's so much money so much time spent in preparing and everything so i would say do it once do it right sort of uh, philosophy just try to go with that so i would definitely recommend taking a preparatory course for that there's a lot of prep centers um, i don't want to say anyone anybody over here but if you reach out to me privately I'll go through the ones that are sort of well known over here, well known here in Canada, and a lot of people use. Okay, just a few more questions that we'll just go. Uh, yes, there's a different. Every province has its own licensing body. That is correct. Like the one in Ontario, it's called Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario, so RCDSO. That's the authority I'm licensed with as well. Where I start my preparation for license, any book required? Any, I think I just answered that question. Uh, if you rewind back a few minutes, if you're listening to the recording, you'll get that answer. Okay, so let's just go back to the presentation. Um, yeah, I think that's all that I had to speak over here. Let's go to the next thing, which says I cleared AFK. What's next? Should I go to school or continue with direct licensing? So, this is the point where let me just go to the side. So this is the point that most people have to debate about whether they should go to school or whether they should continue with direct licensing. School, approximately two to three years, depending different schools have different programs. Direct licensing, technically you can complete everything within one year. If you clear all your exams within the first attempt, yes, you can clear everything in one year. We'll take a look in depth and at the costs as well. So first, let's just take a look on the left side of this chart right here. Again, we'll be following this all the way to the end. So that should answer any questions you have. If I missed out on anything, feel free to ask me in the chat. We'll keep on chatting, checking on the chat periodically. So let's just go to the next two, uh, sorry, to the left side of the screen where you have assessment of clinical judgment and assessment of clinical skills, two exams. We'll take a look at each one of them separately. That's your option one, direct licensing, need to give two exams, ACJ and ACS. ACJ, let's take a look at that first. It's a five and a half hour exam with about a 30 minute break. 120 to 150 single answer or multi answer choice questions. Each section is based on, you have questions on like case based diagnosis, treatment planning and decision, clinical decision making. And then you have radiograph interpretation questions as well. Uh, radiograph interpretation questions would be something like which teeth you see carries on, they have those interproximal bite wings, they might have pans and they might ask you to identify an anomaly, there might be a cyst, anything like that. So you have to identify the location of it, stuff like that. Okay. Again, you have preparatory classes for these as well. So every exam has its preparatory classes um, over here. If you need some links on what the ACJ exam is or what the protocol for the exam is. The protocol has a couple of examples in it as well. Um, so those are the links available right here. And the fees for that exam is about $1,350. Uh, these are all Canadian dollars, not US guys. So that's the fees on the MDB website. And this is the updated fees as of July 1st, 2019. So $1,350. Again, this exam again happens twice a year. No more questions in the chat, that's good. Okay, going to the second exam, the assessment of clinical skills. This is the toughest exam, in my opinion, in this whole system. If you want to go through the direct licensing route in Canada, which is you give the exams, you don't go to school. This, in my opinion, is the toughest exam, right? It's a two-day assessment. There's 12 dental procedures, which you have to do on mannequins in a clinical setting. These are basically the procedures that you have to do. So there's nine restorative and endodontic requirements, which include stuff like class two amalgam prep, class three composite prep, uh, full metal crown prep, PFM prep, endo access prep, 
then you have to do some restorations in which you have to do an amalgam restoration or composite restoration on, on an anterior and a posterior. And then you have to prepare a provisional crown as well. And then the other requirements, record of procedures, how is your record keeping, infection control and safety, and then you have to place a rubber dam as well. So these 12 exams, again, this is all available on the NDB website. This is everything I've in my presentation is taken from there. If you go to the ACS protocols, uh, there will be a link at the end of this ACS section as well, as well as if you go on the uh, in like the sub tab for skills in examinations, you'll see that document over there and everything is in there. Uh, just for an example, let's take a look at, and why I say this is the toughest exam is because the criteria to pass this exam, that's pretty strict, right? So let's just take a look at a random, like one of them, like a PFM crown prep. Just let's take a look at the criteria for it to pass what's like passing, what's a medium and what's fail basically. So you don't have to go through in detail over here, but just to give you like a quick example, we have three examples over here. So they have like a PFM crown prep on a maxillary anterior tooth, which you see right here on top. There's a PFM prep on a mandibular canine and then PFM on a premolar, right? So if you have to prepare them, they'll basically be judging you on, they'll be giving scores to everything. So A plus A, D or E. And then everything has their, it's pretty straightforward defined criteria. Uh, when you're in the exam, you actually get this criteria sheet as well. Like I know you've been practicing with it. So most of the stuff is in your head. Like you're, you've practiced a lot. So you know most of the things, but they give you this sheet as well. So it's not that you don't have to memorize these sheets because basically there's 12 tasks and these are the three sheets for just one task, right? So you don't have to memorize them, but you have a fairly decent idea of what you're doing because you've been practicing that way. So let's just say if you're doing an anterior tooth, let's just look at this one, for example, let's just look at this first column. You get an A plus if there's no undercuts, no axial convergence or taper, how we call it six to 10 degrees. If the taper is more or minor undercuts, you get an A, a lot of taper or the crown does not come off and like a big undercut, uh, then it's a D. Again, more than 25 degree taper, then it's an E, which is like a failing grade there. So pretty strict criteria and to sort of practice according to that and uh, pass according to that, that becomes really tough. But it is doable. People do it every day as well, not to discourage you. Um, then you have same things, PFM prep for a canine tooth, a mandibular canine. Again, most of the criteria would be the same, uh, but there might be some minor alterations there, which is why they have a separate criteria. And then PFM prep on a premolar tooth. Okay. Passing criteria, ACS, like you had 12 tests, uh, how we decided, uh, how we saw earlier, like 12 uh, different activities that you had to do. This is how they determine whether you pass or fail, right? So if you have 12 out of 12 A's or A plus, then you're a pass. If you have 11 A's or A plus and one D, D would basically be like sort of an acceptable, I would guess. It's not like a 100% accurate, but something within the acceptable range, then you get a D. Uh, if you get 11 A's, A plus, then and one E, which is like a not an acceptable grade sort of thing, then still you pass, but with 10, they start getting, you can see as it gets stricter as it goes down, right? If you have eight A's or A pluses, they only allow four D's maximum. If you have any E at all with eight A or A pluses, it would be a fail, basically. That's what any other combination right there means. So that's their passing criteria for the skills exam. And it's a pretty tough exam. Two days, you're stressing out. Uh, it's not easy to do. Again, here's the links for that. Um, that's the link for the, the general page for the skills exam. And then the protocols, so all these previous slides that I showed you, uh, the criteria for every assessment, all the assessments, the passing uh, criteria, this previous slide, everything is in this 2019 protocol document every year they update it. So right now, probably because of COVID, they haven't done the update for the next exam yet. Like all exams currently are suspended. So this would be the most uh, latest one that they have. They would change slightly, but again, you have coaching centers for it. They train you for all the exams, uh, for, uh, for all the tasks that are supposed to be done in the exam, basically. And the fees is pretty high. It's about $9,000 for this two-day two exam. And then to that, you might have to add, for preparation, you're using up a lot of material. You have to buy your own teeth. You have to buy your own instruments. Um, so that cost adds up. Everything you have to buy your own amalgam composite when you're practicing, right? And even finishing discs, finishing strips, whatever you're using. So costs for this exam do add up. 
there's limited seating available in each university as well because these exams are mostly done in the university itself like the school campus of a university because you need a, need a dental unit so sometimes if you can't get and say you're living in Ontario for example in Ontario you only have two centers which is like either University of Toronto or University of Western Ontario if both those places get full you might have to fly out to a different province to give this exam so that cost might add up a little bit there as well The summary for direct, yeah, so that's just a summary. If you want to go through the direct licensing route, uh, that would be your summary. That's the application fee we saw first, $900 where they just verify your documents. If you, for giving the AFK exam, that's an $800 fee, judgment exam, $1,350, and then the skills is a $9,000 exam. This is just the fees that you pay to the NDEB to give that exam. If you're taking any preparatory classes for any of these exams, that is separate to like any coaching center or whoever's teaching you. Right, so the coaching fees is not included in this, or your materials fees, stuff that you have to buy yourself, uh, especially for skills. Uh, here's a historical pass rate of like the last four years of how many candidates apply for every exam and what is the approx passing percentage. So the 2020 stats, uh, usually the exams happen twice a year. That's why all these numbers are in like over 1,000. But 2020 is only the February exam that's been included. Yes, we haven't gone to August 2020 yet. So those numbers are not in. Um, you can see pass percentage in the 40s, higher 40s, you can say uh, somewhere between 35 to 45 over here. And for the skills exam, which is the one that we were just discussing, that's about between 35 and you would say 34 to 39 percent so under 40 percent pass so it is a pretty tough exam you have to be committed to it a lot of people do ask me the question is it um, can i work while i'm studying usually i would say afk is probably like the easiest exam of these three just because um it's a lot of stuff that you have just finished especially for a new grad because it's a lot of stuff that you've done in third year and final year it's more of those stuff come uh, more of that stuff coming up again so AFK, probably the easier ones to pass. Judgment is not that bad either. I would say AFK and judgment probably on the same level. And then skills is definitely the tougher exam to pass. Anything else? Let me just take a look at the chat there and see if there's any messages. So there's some good coaching institutes. Uh, Sabine Khalid, um, there are coaching institutes here. I don't want to say anybody on the chat over here, uh, like the talk over here. Just reach out to me separately and I can give you, like there's a lot of them. I can give you the names of all of them. And I've myself gone for classes to just one of them. So I might have a biased opinion. Uh, definitely it would be a biased opinion. It's been successful for me. That's why, right? So I definitely have a biased opinion, but um, I can give you the other names as well, right? So we can talk about that separately. Is it possible for foreign dental graduates to gain postgrad degree from any institution in Canada? Um, I would say, Aisha, I'm not 100% sure, but I would say no, especially in clinical, I would say no. You do have to have some sort of a DDS equivalent either through license or school. Non-clinical, you might be able to, or like some research-based something, but again, that would be a, I'm not really attuned to that process. I'm not 100% aware about it, but it would be very tough to get into a, a university over here. That's just a, what like some, the feedback I've got from some people, it is pretty tough to get in, but um, we can talk separately about that. And I have a couple of people I can probably put you in touch with if you want to discuss that further with them then. Okay, so that's, uh, we completed on the left side of this chart right now. So we discussed the uh, assessment of clinical. So that was option one, basically, right? After you give your AFK, which everybody has to give, no exceptions in that, you have an option of going for direct licensing, which is these two exams. If you pass these two exams, you reach down here. Let's take a look at option two now, which is a degree completion program, which basically means you go to school. So that's option two. You join a university program for two to three years. One of the important things here to do a degree completion program, you have to be a permanent resident or a citizen of Canada. Uh, that's the, probably one thing I missed out earlier. So let's just say if you're doing this route right here, the ones that are in orange, uh, skills and judgment, you can do that on like a visitor visa or probably like a visitor visa, you could still do those exams. Yes, the degree completion program, no, you cannot do it on like a visitor visa or anything. The other thing, these exams, they do have centers uh, in different parts of the world as well. So you don't have to necessarily come to Canada. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they have centers in Ireland and Australia. Uh, I think London is a center as well. So those 
uh, if you don't have like a Canadian visa to come here. I don't think the skills happens everywhere. I'm not 100% sure about skills, but AFK and judgment definitely happens in different parts of the world. They have their centers there. Um, so now let's take a look at degree completion program in depth. Basically in Canada, there's 10 uh, schools that have dental programs. There's uh, They're all in different provinces, except Montreal has two, which is uh, Montreal has three, McGill University de Montreal and University de Laval. And then uh, Ontario has two, which are these last two right here, University of Toronto and Western Ontario. Otherwise, it's one in every province. Uh, one in most of the other provinces, actually, I should say. Uh, the ones that are highlighted in red, they don't have the degree completion program that we're talking about right here. So this program right here. So if you want to go to school in Canada for uh, two or two and a half years, you cannot apply to University Laval or University of British Columbia. They do not have that two or two and a half year program degree completion program all the other schools have that program okay that's why those two are in red right there university fees this is something that this is from me this is not from the ndv website so that's why it's all there's no link to it or nothing but yes university is expensive tuition fees range about anywhere from for the let's just say it's a two and a half year program right so this range is from about 100,000 to 150,000 realistically. And then you add rent, utilities, transport, meals. You might be graduating anywhere with a depth from about 200 to 300,000. Uh, fees keep going up as well. So when I graduated, I think they're probably up about 5 6% from then. Um, you can get exact figures on like the university websites. They all have their different figures. So that's why I couldn't include them over here. The good thing here in Canada, though, is banks provide you a line of credit. They only need two things. One is you have to be like a citizen or a resident, which you'll obviously be. Otherwise, the university wouldn't have accepted you in the first place. So you'll obviously have either a PR card or like a Canadian passport. And then the other, the only other thing you need is a letter of acceptance from the university stating that you've been accepted into this two and a half year program. That's usually the only two things the banks need to see. And they approve you for a line of credit anywhere from like 250,000 up to almost 400,000, right? Usually about 375 is the max range right now, but they keep upping that every year as well. So you can get a line of credit easily. Uh, the interest rate on the line of credit is quite good as well. Um, it's usually below prime that they give it to you. So you don't get a loan that cheap from the bank for anything else almost, right? Um, so that's one of the good things that a bank would give you a line of credit but fees do rack up quite a bit. So then comes the great debate of, uh, once we just go through questions, uh, can we apply for DDS on AF score, AFK scores? Yes, Yusuf Ansari. So once you have your AFK score, if you go to a degree completion program right here, so degree completion program is a DDS or a DMD degree, right? So Doctor of Dental Medicine or Doctor of Dental Surgery, whichever school offers which. So this is your, so once you graduate this program, you would get either a DDS or a DMD degree, that is correct. So any of these schools except Laval and BC. So here comes the debate like direct licensing versus degree completion, right? Which one should you do? So there's some benefit to each. The direct licensing, obviously it's a part, if, let's just say if you can complete everything in your first attempt, right? Say you give the February AFK exam and then you give the June the same year. Let's just take 2020, for example. If somebody gave their AFK in, February 2020, they gave their, they'll give their, I know it's not happening because of COVID, but let's just assume COVID doesn't exist for a second and we go to, they can give their uh, AFACJ, the judgment and the skills exam in June of 2020. December of 2020, they can give their license, they can give their, sorry, written and OSCE exam and their NDB certified less than a year. From February till December, their NDB certified if they complete all exams within one year. It's quite difficult to do it, yes. But um, people have done it as well. I know people that have done their whole thing within a year, all exams in their first attempt. So that is um, possible as well. Uh, cost would be less than going to a dental school program. Even if you add up all that cost, say 9,000 for the exam, uh, for the skills exam, about 1,500 for the judgment exam, 800 for AFK. AFK and assessment fee doesn't count. Everybody has to pay that, even if you go to school, right? So 9,000 and 1,500 for the judgment. Let's say you spend another 20,000, for example, on your flights, going to different schools, your preparation and everything. Within a forty, fifty thousand dollar range, you'll have completed all your exams, and DEV exams. Uh, school, we just discussed it, it's a lot more, almost three, four times more than amount. Uh, Zainab, that's a good question. Validity period for AFK. Yes, I did forget to mention that. AFK is valid for two years. After you give your AFK exam and you clear it, the score from the your AFK is valid for two years. It has a 75% passing ratio, which I think we did this, sorry, passing uh, score. 
and it's valid for two years. Um, I just had some points. Yeah, the disadvantages of, so the, we discussed the benefits of direct licensing. It's a faster route and it costs less than the degree completion program, like going to school. But then the disadvantages, it's a very stressful exam, especially the skills. And you only have three attempts per exam, right? So if you are not able, let's say, say you cleared your AFK in the first attempt, you cleared your judgment, but then you're stuck on skills. You only have three attempts to clear your skills exam. By the time you're done with those three attempts, uh, and let's just say, you, for worst, let's assume the worst case scenario for a second. So you didn't clear it in all your three attempts. Now you're thinking, okay, let me apply to schools. But by that time, your AFK would have expired, which sort of goes back to Zainab's question, it's only valid for two years, right? So your AFK would have expired. So most likely you'll be in a situation where you'd have to give your AFK again. What I did was I gave my AFK and I tried both routes. I gave the judgment exam as well. I didn't attempt the skills. I wanted to do one exam at a time. Judgment and skills both happen twice a year and they usually happen on consecutive days in June and December. So I only wanted to concentrate on one exam at a time. So I gave judgment and this was 2014. So I gave AFK February of 2014 judgment in june of 2014 and i applied to schools as well my plan was if i don't get into schools in 2014 in june of 2015 i'll give the skills exam at that time exams were only once a year now it's twice a year so that's something else uh, but um so my situation was a little bit different but that was my plan how to do it uh, basically concentrate on one exam at a time and keep both routes open i would recommend everybody else to keep both routes open as well uh, if you ask me for my personal preference my personal preference is going to a school versus direct licensing uh, because I went to school over here and I learned a lot, right? So my personal preference, definitely whoever asks me, I recommend them going to school, especially especially if you're a new graduate from uh, countries like India, Pakistan, Iran, wherever. If you're a new graduate, I would definitely recommend going to school over here. Um, just had a few more points here. Yeah, so direct licensing, let's just see the benefits of that and the disadvantages of that then. So the benefits, you graduate with like a degree, a DDS or a DMD degree, which helps you if you especially want to go and specialize uh, in any field. Uh, having a degree with your, with your name would definitely help you a lot. More options, yeah, if you apply to specialty programs, that's right. And then later on in life, let's just say 20 years later, you decide, you're in Canada right now, 20 years later in life, you decide you want to move to the States for any reason, right? Or you're moving somewhere else to, the, to Europe or to Australia for any reason. Having a degree from like one of the Western, uh, how do I phrase this? What do I say here? Yeah, like uh, one of these schools, like a Canadian school or like a North American school would help you make your certification process in other countries a little bit easier. This is again, my personal opinion. That's how I think about it. I'm not sure if you agree with me or no, but um, I think having a degree from one of these schools, say if I, like I also graduated in Pakistan, right? If uh, I want to move to Australia now, I think this, I would have to go through a lot more tests and exams over there versus if I haven't done it from a Canadian school, it might be a little bit easier. I don't know the requirements for Australia. I'm just, that's just a guess I'm making. Mm, yeah, the, the other advantage of getting into a university program, I would say would be uh, you're guaranteed to like as long as you don't fail your courses and stuff like that, but like you're sort of on a guaranteed route to getting your degree and graduating out of school as a dentist versus if you're going for the direct licensing route, like I know you do prep for the exams and stuff like that, but you just saw how strict the grading criteria is, right? So it's a little bit of a gamble there whether you'll pass or not. If you pass, yeah, you hit the jackpot, that's right. But uh, if you don't, then it's a cycle of depression, prepping for the exam again, spending money again, spending time again, stuff like that. I just answer your question, Tamanna, in a second. Uh, I just finished my train of thought here. And um, so going to a university where, as you know, okay, 2.5 years down the road, I spend all this money and stuff, but I'm as long as I don't, you don't fail any exams or you keep up with all your requirements, you know you're going to graduate with a degree. So you have that sense of security a little bit as well. So it's a lot of peace of mind. Yeah. Uh, the disadvantages of like going to school, there's not many. But um, some people do ask me a question saying, is there a difference in getting a job if you go through direct licensing versus if you've done it through a school? I would say no, because uh, first of all, your patients don't know whether you've done, like um, you've gone to school or you've done direct licensing, right? And even if you've done direct licensing, you have a degree in some other country. It could be anywhere in the world, but you do have a degree, right? So you can, if you want to display that in your office, you can for sure. Secondly, you are certified to work in Canada. So nobody can discriminate against you saying, that no, you're a direct licensing person, I don't like you or something like that. They can't say that, you are certified to work in Canada. 
uh, or at least that province, sorry, not Canada, like in that uh, NDB certifies you to work in Canada and then you go, you're licensed in any of the provinces. So uh, there's not a big difference. Some people, there might exist some prejudice somewhere saying, no, I prefer people that have gone to schools over here or someone, if they're like an international dentist themselves, they're like, oh, I want somebody from that's being trained the same way as me. It might exist, might exist, but extremely minimal. You won't find that a major hurdle when you're looking for a job here. Disadvantage, and the other disadvantage is the cost. It's a pretty high cost that you're getting, okay? Um, and I'll just answer these questions for a bit and then go back to the slides again. So come and ask, okay, so now we're at this point where we've discussed uh, degree completion or direct licensing, one of the two rules that you take. And then these two would be either one, right? Either you completed ACS or it's an ACJ, what to do now, or you went to school for two to three years approximately, completed your DDS or your DMD degree. Sorry, I should have had that DMD there too. And what to do now. So you would be in either one of those two situations. So the next thing you do is just an application to the NDEB saying, okay, I've completed what you told me to do, either those two exams or the degree please enroll me in the program for the written exam. That's a very simple application that's done online and stuff like that. You have to pay a, pay a fees for it again, but uh, that's, I don't think the these guys have to pay, not the direct licensing one. These guys definitely have to pay that fees, the degree completion one. So now we come to the next exam, which is the NDB written exam and OSCE. The written exam. Again, you have this protocol sheet for it, which basically tells you a percentage of uh, questions from each subject or category. It's a 300 multiple choice question. Uh, the weightage for, you can see pharmacology and stuff is a little bit lower compared to us 24%. It's almost uh, less than half now for that. Um, oral medicine, pathology. Now they're concentrating more on making sure you can diagnose stuff and stuff like that. You don't miss out on stuff, right? Treatment planning and diagnosis, that plays a major role now in this written exam. So, Again, you have anatomy, occlusion, fixed dentures, stuff like that. So again, this is available on the in the written exam protocol. I have a link attached for it as well, and it's available on their website as well. And this is again an approximate weightage. It doesn't have to be an exact number. Um, that's the link for the protocols. Like it, it, the protocol for any exam, it tells you everything. And when I mean everything, it tells you. Uh, what time you're supposed to come at the center, like first, first of all, where the exam's gonna be, what time you're gonna be there, half an hour early, one hour early, what documents you need to bring with you. Are you allowed to bring a pen? You can only bring a pencil, you can't bring an eraser, you can bring a sharpener, whatever is there, everything is on that document. So go through it in depth, like whichever exam you're giving, I would recommend read that protocols for that exam in depth, right? It tells you each and everything about that exam. Once you read through that document, like if you, for example, read through all these five documents, AFK, the protocols for AFK, ACJ, ACS, written and OSCE, you can sit on this side and present to anybody else. That's all that's needed. It's just these five documents that you have to read and you would get the whole system. You'll understand everything. So written exam, yes, 300 multiple choice questions and that's the link. And then we go to the OSCE. You most schools in Pakistan as well, they started doing OSCEs too. So it's a station type exam. You review the information that's provided. You might be given a case history, charts, radiographs, models, stuff like that, and answer the questions. Five minutes at each station, pretty standard OSCE, which is basically objective structured clinical exam, right? And here's the link for the OSCE protocols uh, for 2020. Okay, let's just... Take a look at the, okay, let's just go. Yeah, let's just take a look for questions and if there are any. No, I don't see any questions there. So application fee, uh, that's just a summary of, um, no, sorry, that's not a summary. That's a, the written exam application fee. One time you have to pay $450, which is this right here. Let's just go back a bit. So this right here, when you're transferring application to the NDB certification process for graduates of accredited dental programs, these guys, they have to pay this fee. So $450, then you give the written exam. I'm assuming everybody's giving it in Canada, so but they have a different rate. So if you're giving it in Canada, your written exam is $1,000, and then the OSCE again is $1,000, $1,100 if you're giving it anywhere outside of Canada. Again, I'm thinking the centers for these are, uh, again, Australia, Ireland, I think London. There might be some in the US as well. I'm not 100% sure, but those are the most common ones, uh, Europe, London, uh, Ireland, and Australia. And this exam, 
uh, the written and ASCII, everybody has to give it. If you have, if, uh, it doesn't matter whether you came from abroad or you started your dentistry from here in first year. Even the local students, they have to give this exam, written exam and ASCII. So nobody can get certified in Canada without getting giving these two exams. It doesn't matter, like I said, if you're studying from here, from first year, you came here into Canada and you did direct licensing, or you came into Canada and you went to school again. Everybody has to give this exam. Um, you can see the past three years, past percentage pretty high, close to 95 for like the OSCE and like high 80s for the written exam as well. So it's a fairly, it's a, the passing criteria here is a lot easier than in the AFK. The material for the AFK is the same thing that you studied. Sorry, the material for the written exam is the same thing that you studied during your AFK. So you have a head start plus the school trains you a lot on both these things as well. So assuming you cleared these two exams, written in exam and OSCE, you've met that standard. Now you're basically NDEB certified, which means like uh, the national body of dental exams has said, okay, you're good to go ahead and apply for your license, which brings us to the stage, I'm almost done, ready to apply for my license. Licensure in Canada, it's provincial. So every province has its own licensing body. You just basically make an application to them. Uh, your university forwards you forwards them your marks transcript and stuff like that. They get your NDEB information directly from the NDEB, and uh, basic and it just takes them a short amount of processing time. One of the things they do require is a good standing certificate from your previous licensing body. So for me, it would be the PMDC. That did take me a long time to get my good standing completed from PMDC. It was a it was really a big hassle for me, right? Because I was here, I didn't have anybody there in Islamabad to sort of contact PMDC or anybody. If you do have somebody that's good, the one advice I would give you is if you've gone through school or direct licensing, whatever, um, start this process of uh, getting your good standing from your association back home about six, seven months in advance. Don't wait until you've cleared all the exams and then start, uh, then, then when you apply, they ask for this document, it will take them another six, seven months to give you this document. You'll just be sitting idle, not doing anything. And that's it. Um, so for general dentistry, that's it. If you're coming from Pakistan, India, Iran, whichever country in the world, to Canada, that's it. Once you're done through this process, you did it. You're ready to you met your NDEB requirements and you are licensed to practice in whichever province you choose to in Canada, okay? So congratulations on that. <laughs> Uh, link to reference text and release questions. This is what I said in the start that uh, the release questions is like a 400 page document. It's like a question bank that they give out. They have questions that they that are currently being used in the exams as well. They have questions that they've retired from the exams. They have questions that they're trying out, new questions that they're trying out. They have all sorts of questions in there. Um, it's a 400 page document. Each page has about 10 or 11 MCQs, BCQs, whatever you want to call it on there. So it's a pretty, it gives you a fairly good idea of how to prepare when you're going through it, right? And then the other thing over there is, uh, in the beginning, we did discuss about books to use when you're studying stuff like dental decks, uh, like coaching classes, first aid, Mosby, stuff like that. Uh, this link, it also has the resources that actually the NDEB recommends that you study. It's books and it's like 11 pages of just book names. If you go there, you'll be able to see it. Yes, ideally, yes, you should be studying that. Practically, is it possible? Not for me. I don't want to speak for anybody else, but not for me. So, but like, uh, if there's a question that is, um, I would say somewhat debatable, somebody's telling you the one thing, the other person's telling you the other thing, these are the resources that the NDB uses to phrase their answer. So if something's in this, in one of the books and you find it in there, use their reference books, then that should be the correct answer. So for debatable questions or stuff like that, use their provided resources, I would recommend. So that's it for like a general dentist coming from, uh, any other country to Canada. Let's just take a look. Uh, no more questions on chat. That's good. Uh, for specialists. So <laughs> if you're coming to, so again, you would be like a non-accredited dental specialty program if you're coming from anywhere in the world except North America or like the colleges that we discussed earlier, the Australia, New Zealand, one university in Saudi Arabia, you would be a non-accredited dental specialist. So the first thing you do is you, you graduate over here and then you apply to take the DSCKE, which is basically the dental specialty core knowledge exam, right? 
So it's 95 to 100 questions, clinical situations, radiographs, photographs again, and there's the link for the protocol for that. It's sort of similar to an OSCE exam again, um, not really tough, but based on this score over here for the dental specialty core knowledge exam, you then apply to a dental specialty assessment and training program or DSAT as it's called. Uh, DSAT is specific to every field, not every university offers it, only four in Canada do. And every all those that offer it don't offer every program as well. Like, for example, Dalhousie University, which is in Nova Scotia, it only offers a DSAT program for oral and maxillofacial surgery. BC offers it for a few more, endo, medicine and path, ortho, pedo, perio, and pros. And then Manitoba only offers it for pedo and ortho, but Manitoba, it's currently not. It was on the, again, this is all on the NDB website. On the NDB website, it says Manitoba is not currently accepting uh, new admissions, but um, check for it. It should be updated pretty soon. Again, all this information is on the website. And then Toronto offers it as well, and Toronto offers it at almost all the specialties, right? Dental anesthesia, public health, endo, path med, radio, prosto, perio, everything. So if you're a specialist looking to come here and work in Canada as a specialist, so this does not allow you to work as a general dentist. So let's just say you're an orthodontic specialist in Pakistan, for example. You come here to Canada, you go through these steps right here, you graduated from a non-accredited program, you apply, you took this exam, you went to which schools offer ortho. So you went to either BC, Manitoba, or Toronto, either one place, you've completed your exam, you graduated, you finished the program, you can only work as an orthodontist. You can't start doing root canals or fillings or stuff like that, unless you have that general dentistry qualification that we discussed before. So this is a specialist, uh, how would you say, it's like an isolated specialty program only. Once you completed your program, you go for the NDSC, which is the exam, uh, the specialty exam, and it has a written and an oral component. You have your peers and stuff like that. They come in, it's like having an external, internal, you have your viva, they give you cases. It's a pretty tough exam, but obviously you have your specialty education from back home. You've been trained again for one year. Most of these programs are one year. So all these programs that I mentioned over here, they're usually a one year bridging program, almost you can think of it that way. So you've been trained again, so you should be good in your written and your oral component for the exams there. And again, once you clear that exam, you can apply for a license to whichever state you want to practice in. Okay, so licenses here in Canada, they're not national licenses, they are provincial licenses. Uh, references, everything I said on this talk, the, everything was from, like I mentioned at the start as well, from the National D Dental Examining Board of Canada, and that's the website for them. Um, sorry, one thing I had promised I would talk about, but I missed about it, was the IELTS requirement for uh, when you were applying to schools. Somebody had asked that in the chat earlier. So you need an overall of 6.5 with no band below 6. That's for UFT, University of Toronto, right? So when you're applying to a school, they need a minimum of 6.5 with no band below 6. They have an option of giving TOEFL as well. I'm not sure. But if, again, if you go to dentistry.utoronto.ca, that's their website, or you just search up uh, University of Toronto Dentistry, you'll find that. And then you go, they have a section where it says uh, prospective students. And then you go into whether you're like a regular student applying from first year or like an IDAP. So you would qualify as an IDAP, International Dentist Advanced Placement Program. So you go to that part and then you read in it. They'll give you the scores for the Canadian benchmark, what they expect in the English language, as what they expect and TOEFL what they expect. That's it. Uh, that's like a condensed version of um, what to sort of expect and how to go about it in Canada. Uh, any questions? My email address is given as well. If you have any separate questions, I know some people I told out reach to me privately. You can reach out to me over here on email. Perfect. So thank you everybody for tuning in and hopefully I'll see you in Canada someday soon. If you come here, do reach out to me. Okay. We'll hopefully meet up. Perfect. Take care. Bye-bye. So that was the presentation, guys, which we just went through. Um, I just have two more updates to give everybody over here. Uh, these were pretty recent. So one of them is that the NDEB, the National Dental Examining Board of Canada, they're going to be making a year-round center in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. So instead of the exams, uh, the skills exam and the judgment exam happening just two times a year now, it would be like a year-round center where you can go in and give your exam whenever you're ready. So if you wanted to pick a date in November, in March, August, whenever you could go in there, it's not in function yet as far as I know, but that's something they're planning to start in 2022. The second recent update that we have from the NDEB is uh, when I sort of went through the exams, they would send our scores to all the universities as from the AFK exam. Now they're changing it. It's going to be 
just a pass-fail that they report to the universities, and they won't automatically report it. You have to let them know which universities to send your pass-fail grades to. So it's just like IELTS, for example. So if you were applying to, let's say you came, gave your AFK, you passed, and then you're applying only to three universities, you just let them know, please send it to these, this, this, and this one only, except of them sending it to all eight of them, right? Um, so just those two basic updates. Uh, none of them are in function right now. They're both going to start 2022 onwards, so if you're, which is pretty soon now. So uh, like I think and if you're looking at this video right now to sort of learn for the future, so then these both will apply to you. Thank you very much. That's important. But also I was thinking uh, they've actually like uh, trailing behind USA in this format because they've also uh, removed, uh, it's been about a decade, but they also removed the percentage uh, from, the mar uh, from the exam. And uh, now it's just pass and fail. And a lot of people, I personally think, when they think of uh, the exam being pass and fail, think that it's going to be easier to get into universities. I personally think, I don't know how, what you think about this, but I, I personally think it's going to be the exact opposite. If you have only pass and fail, ja hai, to jiska 99 hai, wo bhi pass hai. Aur jiska 51 hai, or the 99 is pass, and the 51 is pass, the pass hai. So we will see the rest of the other things in the CVP. Community work, kiya nahi kiya, research work, kiya nahi kiya, courses, kiya nahi kiya, internships, kiya nahi kiya, because you're both equal. You're both equal. Class mein jo, yeah. So in your class, the first one was the one who didn't show the paper, he and you are now equal. You've given 6 supplements, 10 annuals, you've cleared it. You and you are both equal. Hai. So now everything else matters. Now. Is that, I think, uh, is that correct? Yeah, it's fair of it to think that way. It's a advantage and a disadvantage, right? So like passing percentage is 75 and above for AFK. Yeah. So the jo 76 like a password, for example, he's the same as your 99 like a password. So yeah. 99 wala socha ga yaar mein niche a gaya uske level pe. 76 <laughs> wala khush hoga ke mein upar chala gaya. So, focus on pe. the 75. So, <laughs> no, no, aim for the higher thing, guys. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's like they've changed it from pass and fail. I think it takes away the stress of the exam a little bit uh, in that way that you're not aiming to just go for like a really really high score. Uh, so stress level for the exam, as long as you pass, then you basically and also they unko bhi they they want like a holistic kind of an individual, well rounded, correct? So exactly. like nerd now. No, that is very important. I think soft skills ka wo bhi aa Exactly. Exactly. Achas, In, so, interview is a major part of ad admissions to universities. So achha, interview mein all majority of aapko, all of them. Interview mein aapko majority uh, judge karte hai, first of all ke, like are you a good fit for them and then are they a good fit for you? So both no cheese judge hoti hai usme. Achha, nee, nee, we don't really care. We we are a good fit, you know. Let them consider <laughs> that for, for us. Our <laughs> university is perfect. Achha. So, uh, nahi, thank you very much for the very detailed presentation, Adil, uh, Dr. Adil. I have to be really formal because a lot of people are going to see this uh, the world over. So, obviously, Dr. Adil, DDS, BDS, uh, you know, BDS Square, I have to say a lot of people. Let's answer the questions that you have asked on in Instagram. Pe. Uh, CV um, important hai, definitely, right? Uh, there is it is a combination of a lot of things. So I'll just recap all the things that are important and then concentrate more on CV. So your AFK and now it's pass and fail, your GPA, um, then your CV, your interview score, bench exam score. Now CV in particular, uh, it is very important if you have done internships, externships, uh, extra taken part in research. Research is a big thing over here. So if you have some research papers that you've taken part in something with your professors, put those on as well. It just shows that you're not like focused on clinical dentistry only, but you're a more well-rounded person uh, concentrating on other aspects of dentistry as well. You're not only just drill fill kind of a person. How did you build your CV for getting into advanced standing program? Uh, I mean, I just basically put everything that I did. So when I was in school, I was into debate competitions a lot, poster competitions, uh, like re doing research and stuff like that. It's not a necessary thing to have when you apply to schools. Like I applied to, I got accepted into University of Toronto, right? So let's just talk about that. Um, the documents I submitted to UFT were my CV, yes, you're correct, my mark, my mark sheet, like the consolidated mark sheet that all your universities have. 
there's an interview that they take as well. UFT does not have a bench exam to like an entrance exam where you have to do like a prep, cavity preparation, filling or anything like that. Most of the other universities do, but UFT does not. So uh, there was just the interview over there. And then your AFK score goes to them directly from your from the NDEB, the first exam that you gave. So it's a consolidated thing. It's not just only your CV that they're looking at and taking your making a decision based on that. I think CV would probably play the least amount of role because there's nothing on that that they can verify, right? Plus standards are different in every country. So I think the factors that play a major role would be the interview that they take first of you, uh, first with you. That would be one of the major things. Your AFK score definitely. And then they have their own calculation system where they calculate your GPA based on uh, based on the consolidated mark sheet. They have their own formula. It's available on the UFT website as well. It used to be available when I used to look at it, but I'm not sure if it does. I'm guessing it would still be. Uh, but um, but yeah, so they take all those factors into consideration and then they make a decision on it. So UFT, I know they take 24 students per year the international students coming in for the degree completion program every school has a different number uft i think takes the most at 24. okay uh the second question is uh com kind of compare uh Mahatma kindly compare the difficulty level if you can to ore and usa tests is it tougher? ORE, is it you know i have no idea to be honest uh for the usa part one part two i have given it but um my experience for giving that is it's like very easy. It's not applicable to anybody else because I studied over here for two and a half years at Toronto and then I gave my part one, right? So it's probably a, extremely bad to tell you for part one, I studied for like two days and for part two, I studied for four hours. Like I just went through. We'll, de we'll delete this just, question and this <laughs> answer like is not apply on you. Yeah, I just went for a couple of sample papers. But like here at the school, they teach you that conceptual learning, which is important to answer part one, part two type of questions. Yeah. Over there, you do rote learning, right? Which is why it takes a bit um, longer. If I talk about my Canadian exams, yeah, for the first exam, I studied for six months. So comparing okay. that to parts, so I would say probably spend the same amount of time on your US exam as well. And also, uh, you said test papers. Where can we find test papers? Yeah. So it's on the, uh, there was a link in my presentation as well. Uh, and okay. if you go to the NDEB website, uh, you'll see a staple question, uh, sorry, a section called sample questions or released questions, they call it. Okay. And there's about 400 pages worth of questions in that, and they cover all the subjects. Okay. Can we take that to the exam? Uh, I wish, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, can we, Sana ne puchai, can we go directly for a specialization program without doing the NDEP accreditation? I would say no. You have to give that first exam in the DSAT process that we just talked about a uh, little okay. bit previously. In we the still have to do that. You don't have to do the dentistry exams they're like the afk and if you can directly go for specialization as well i think so you have to do like a bridging program so do the dsat first exam uh then the specialization bridging program and then give your specialization final exam how much time is how much time an average bds graduate clears these canadian tests so uh 100 years no no <laughs> No, you can technically clear them in, in a year, right? Now, before, like when I did, there were exams only once a year. Now they're twice a year. In the future, they're going to be happening like whenever you want to give it. So whenever you want to give you it. You could uh, technically do it everything within one year. Uh, it is very tough, yes. So realistically, I would say probably two years. But I know a lot of people that have done it in that if they do the whole thing in their first attempt, they can do it within one year. Okay. And is it like a, a cap, like in states, you can't take the exam for, again for three months? uh once I'm, if you've taken it once i'm not sure about that uh right now the exams were only happening twice a year and those were automatically ah, like three yeah. months apart, maybe, so maybe they fine. can have a new i don't maybe know maybe they will have a new yeah, pool we haven't still gotten like full guidelines maybe they've released it i just haven't read through uh, what the criteria okay. is how Makes soon sense. can you like reappear the other thing i do know is they are removing the limit you used to have a three exam limit like you could only give the exam three yeah exams, but i think yeah with the new system that they're going to bring in they're removing if you're like like hopefully not, but uh, if you don't clear the exam five times, you can still give it a six time. Like I hope that doesn't happen to anybody, but that is still a option that they have. Okay, so how did you, Rabia, Rabian Malik? How did you? And I think it's the last or second last question. How did you prepare for Canadian DAT and IELTS? So I didn't give the DAT exam. DAT exam applies to students that are joining from first year. So local students who do their high school undergrad over here, then they give the DAT exam. I okay. give the AFK exam. 
IELTS, I just studied, uh, like got some IELTS practice books from, I was in Karachi when I did IELTS, uh, so I just got some practice books, those CDs that they have, just listened to, practiced a few times and then went and gave it. Movies. Oh, no, <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, I think, yeah, the questions are up. Last uh, two questions, they're, they're mine. And those are the questions that I think most people are interested in knowing the answers to. Number one, all of this khwari ke baad, all of these exams, all of this cost, all of this effort, time, energy, mind, everything. Uh, after all of this, is it worth it to practice in Canada as a dentist? Okay. So, uh, yeah, in one word answer, definitely, right? And uh, if you want me to elaborate, uh, yeah. Uh, so, I agree with everything you said. So, the stress, the khwari, the late night of studying, uh, putting in long hours, especially if you're working with it as well, if you have to like support your family. So it is a very stressful period, however long it takes you to get your license, right? Now you do write exams or schools for another two, three years, whatever. Uh, but once you get your license, after that, definitely it is worth it. You do have a comfortable, like, okay, in the beginning, again, once you get your license, you will struggle a little bit as you're learning the ropes. Uh, but yeah. let's say one year after getting your license, have you been working for the past one year? You definitely have a very comfortable lifestyle after that yeah there are student okay. loans and stuff to pay off but uh you're well set you get that. used to it there's a lifestyle that everybody's it doing a, it and they're paying off loans it is by, a life, as they exactly. are living and you're not struggling to pay off your loans it is like uh like you don't have to dip deep into your reserves or your pockets to pay off those loans like whatever money you're bringing in every month as your salary you can easily pay off yeah. a portion towards your loans portion if you have like a house mortgage whatever yeah because you, uh, i'm sorry i'm interrupting you uh, there's, no there's also a point uh which is i think i in our culture or in this side of the world is that you know we don't want loans right. we don't want loans and there's and a stigma in, uh, attached with it there's a stigma yeah, attached with it. something like udhara kisi pe or something yeah udhara to aapne bas dena hai wapas kal right. lene se pehle hi wapas kar do usko agree and uh, <laughs> bahar ye it's a lifestyle wo unke bacche bhi even billionaires they live over mortgages bhai unko dene unko puri cheez khareedni nahi hai wo they keep paying their thing uh, their uh, installments and uh, they can live a life so uh, yeah so i think that is i think something that we have to you know screw in no it is definitely a mentality change uh, you unless somebody is like uh, like way 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 rich over there then they can come and maybe like do stuff on their own but if you want to come here like let's say to buy a house right i don't know anybody over here that can afford to buy a house right on cash everybody yeah. goes to a bank for a loan so that stigma that is attached with taking a loan and uh, there is not as much over here everybody uses credit even for studying in university student loans that's all very common over here so a lot of students and including me we were asking if you can you know give us your you know credit some details <laughs> is that possible you know? uh, it will you really <laughs> help a lot of people you know especially me it will really help me okay okay uh, last question okay akhir sawal wo ye of course aapne mujhe bata diya ki lifestyle is good but sab log ye puchne chahte hain ki bhai how much what is the minimum salary that you can earn hypothetically in canada and does that very a lot if you are in can in 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 a particular place in canada ya aap ottawa mein to aap itne kamayenge ya aap toronto mein aap itne kamayenge aap mississauga mein to wo aap itne kamayenge ya ek range hai overall aur minimum itne mein to dentist aap salary kamayega hi kamayega chahe wo kahin bhi ho canada mein okay so uh, good question just to give the viewers an idea right um jo yahan pe jo jahan pe main hu i am in mississauga बेसिकली जो ग्रेटर टोरंटो एरिया कहलाता है जी टी ए इसमें स्टैंडर्ड हमारी जो सैलरी का कॉम्पनसेशन जो आता है इट इज फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ कलेक्शन ठीक है फर्स्ट करें एक रूट कनाल फर्स्ट करें थाउजेंड डॉलर की आपने बिलिंग की यूजली यहाँ पे बिलिंग इंश्योरेंस को जाती है फर्स्ट करो इंश्योरेंस ने सिर्फ नौ सौ डॉलर पे किया तो आपको थाउजेंड के फोर्टी परसेंट नहीं मिलेगा नौ सौ का फोर्टी परसेंट मिलेगा दैट इज समथिंग कलेक्शन और बिलिंग्स में क्या डिफरेंस है then okay. uh, if you go outside of gta especially thoda remote jayenge to you get 45% now that 5% grand, th- grand theft grand theft auto yeah na nah, <laughs> greater toronto area <laughs> yeah uh, or again gta se like bahar jayenge northern areas mein so it's 45% now for an average gta mein kyunki competition zyada hai uh, yeah. to schedule mein aapke gaps aayenge uh, patient cancellations wagera yahan pe zyada hota hai to mm. average hum log school mein bhi wagera kehte the ki gta mein you can easily earn about 10 to 12000 dollars a month if you're working at least 5 days a week 
ठीक है अगर आप सिक्स डेज कर रहे हो तो ऑब्वियसली आप थोड़े ऊपर जाओगे आप अगर फोर डेज कर रहे हो तो आप नीचे आओगे इफ यू गो साइड ऑफ जी टी ए देन यू कैन प्रोबेबली एवरेज इवन मोर देन ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड मंथ बट दैट डिपेंड्स अ लॉट ऑन वॉट प्रोसीजर्स यू आर डूइंग अगर आप इम्प्लांट्स ऑल्सो कर रहे हो तो इट बम्प्स अप ड्रास्टिकली अगर आप सिर्फ फिलिंग्स कर रहे हो तो यू विल बी डूइंग अ लॉट ऑफ फिलिंग्स एंड प्रोबेबली आप वो एट टेन उस रेंज पे रहोगे एंड डिपेंड्स ऑन हाउ मेनी आर्स यू मेक सेंस जनरल डेंटिस्ट्री दोस्ट आर जस्ट जनरल डेंटिस्ट्री बेसिकली यार दोस्ट आर जस्ट रफ आइडियाज ऑफ कोर्स डेफिनेटली फॉलो नहीं होता हर जगह बट दैट्स लाइक अ गुड Like you can call a baseline कि आप अपना अपने बारे में सोच सको कि कितने range में आप and 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 that is you saying after the deduction or before deduction no so billing would be about say twenty twenty two a month and then आपका take home उसमें से forty percent ten thousand होगा so yeah, take okay. home is take still, home monthly still. is take home monthly is about ten roughly in the G- outside of GTA you would be higher at least twenty take home आप average कर रहे होंगे बिल्कुल yeah. basic dentistry भी कर रहे हो coming out of school yeah. okay not coming out of school right away but at least one year after school बिल्कुल फिर भी आप basic yeah. dentistry भी कर रहे हो तो annual आपका hundred or hundred and fifty के बीच तक बन सकता है makes sense if you're outside the GTA then you can even go way higher makes sense वो well, I think that just depends on uh, the amount of patients that you see and the um, the so type of treatments that you do exactly the type Both, of treatments that can treatment. even differ uh, इन पर्टिकुलर क्लिनिक एक बंदा है वो इतने कमा रहा है दूसरा बंदा उसको दस गुना कमा रहा है बिकॉज ही डूइंग मोर एडवांस इम्प्लांट लगा लो और दूसरा बंदा पांच दिन से फिलिंग्स करता रहे तो definitely us us sab ko idea ho sakta hai right exactly so uh, i am an implant specialist so agar if you have any you know vacancy in your uh, yeah. practice just <laughs> you always welcome no, no, <laughs> nobody would know <laughs> ke maine aake implant laga diya what's the worst that could happen you would lose your license okay i'm just kidding <laughs> oh, okay. uh, thank you very much uh, again uh, adil uh, for the dr adil for the uh, wonderful session and for the detailed session and uh, light hearted session i'm sure it will have a lot of people No, not at all. Uh, thank you. I have to say thank you to you. I saw recently, like you started this new channel, uh, focusing more on dental, uh, dentistry, and then dentistry abroad as well, right? So uh, I was meaning to text you about it as well, but then I forgot. So I think this is the perfect time to sort of say it. Uh, it's really good. <laughs> publicly. Uh, yeah, publicly. You know, <laughs> let me acknowledge that it's good. So it's very good because, like, uh, even when I was preparing to come to Canada, right? So in twenty. 11 2012 12 when i was thinking about it and then 2013 when i moved here uh, there was no one place for me to go and get all this information i had to gather information tips and bits from everybody some people who had given the canadian exam go on the internet read through stuff on my own uh, didn't know anybody that i could reach out to who could like guide me what to do what not to do etc so i think it's a really and good thing and by the way or jab and when you're done with it you realize ke- Almost everyone you know has already taken it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that sometimes happens too. But no, it's very, uh, very good initiative. And uh, if you ever need me back over here, uh, just let me know, and I'll try my best to uh, do another update. Or if we want to do something else. Perfect. And uh, take care, and we'll see you soon. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you yeah, very much. Soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, Allah Hafiz. Bye.